This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting on the Larkin T Hospital TV Neurosurgical channel today and also the Neurosurgical.tv channel. Uh, today we have the, the pleasure uh, of having Slavin. Uh, he's a medical student from Croatia and he's a passionate neurosurgical student. And today he's going to talk about the life and times of Harvey Cushing. And we have a distinguished panelist with us, the uh, ubiquitous Simon. And Simon, why don't you say hi to the crowd? Hello. So great to be here as always. Uh, Slavin, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Uh, as you know, I'm a medical student also and a developmental psychologist. And thank you for teaching me so much about neurosurgery. Yeah, Simon's a little muted because he's it's uh, two or three in the morning over in Japan. Yeah. And the star of the show, Slavin, welcome. Hello, hello everyone. I'm very glad to be here and I would like to, to thank uh, to Dr. Bennett and Simon for such a great collaboration and for the opportunity to present something like this here. Uh, because this was kind of special presentation that I made for uh, the Rotten course I'm leading here in Zagreb. Uh, so uh, this was a course that's tried to to uh, bind together medical students who are interested in neurosurgery and to provide them with uh, what is neurosurgery and, and with some essentials to understand what's happening in the operating room. So uh, I would like to proceed to the presentation now. Uh, I would uh, like you to, to consider this presentation first, uh, firstly to say uh, is uh, a thing that uh, I try to add to the to the very hard task of uh, giving a presentation on the life of uh, someone as big as uh, Dr. Harvey Cushing was. Uh, he was one of the leading neurosurgeons uh, of of all times, and and uh, he was also the father of modern neurosurgery. So I would like to. Uh, you to consider my presentation as, as uh, based on anecdotes from his life and, and is a part of uh, more of try to understand him and, and uh, who he was, uh, how he was perceived and uh, how many great things he, he has done. So, uh, And also uh, I would like to take you after the presentation into the operating halls of the Peter Ben Bryan Hospital in Boston where Professor Cushing was operating and uh, to make you a part of his team. So let's start. Uh, I'll just try screen sharing this. Okay. Uh, I hope you can see the screen. Yes. All right. So now we have here the, the presentation. Uh, I'll just wait until it's loaded. So uh, you can see this, yes? Okay. Uh, so Harvey Williams Cushing uh, was uh, a man who made the birth of modern neurosurgery possible. I uh, purposely put this in this word, uh, word because uh, I think he was really the, the one man who was responsible for all the essentials that, was, that were needed to be undertaken to make operating neurosurgery or surgery possible. We are now talking about the time of the, the end of the 19th century uh, when uh, neurosurgery along with the cardiac surgery who developed the latest uh, only around the, the, the end of the World War II, uh, they were considered impossible. So uh, this was due to because of, of many things that should have been done uh, in order to be able to safely operate the brain. So now uh, I would like to start with a short video. Wilder Penfield. He cured my seizures and hundreds more. 
would say he drew the roadmap of the human brain. We just called him the greatest Canadian alive. Yeah, no, I don't know about the greatest Canadian alive part, but uh, I think <laughs> he he really is one of the of the greatest neurosurgeons, certainly. So uh, this is Dr. Wilder Penfield, and uh, I know this presentation is on Harvey Cushing, but allow me just just this little uh, little introduction into the life of, of Harvey Cushing via uh, this man. Uh, I think Penfield is important because uh, he did some things that uh, were considered original in neurosurgery. So he's the author of the homunculus. Uh, we can see it here. So that is the the map of functional areas of our brain that made functional neurosurgery possible. And I think uh, it also made uh, every procedure based on the cerebral cortex possible. Because we can see here uh, certain areas of the of the uh, cortex, the doctor Penfield meticulously captured with his uh, brain stimulation procedure. So he would use the wand, uh, a little electrical current producing stick that would make uh, th that would stimulate these areas and give a response. And he would map these responses and then add to them a certain function they they do. So he was considered the first one, but I would like to show you in this presentation that he really wasn't the first one and that he owes a lot to Cushing for his uh, procedures. Uh, the video that we saw was, was the one uh, on the epilepsy. Dr. Penfield was operating uh, epilepsy and while doing this uh, operation, he uh, found that there are certain engrams, uh, certain neural circ circuits that are pathological in the temporal lobe of the epilepsy patient. So he could provoke these uh, very complex uh, auras that would precede the epileptic seizure and that uh, made him the idea to map these areas. So he, he kind of uh, was involved into areas that, that made him possible to map all of this. Cushing wasn't so so a functional neurosurgery oriented uh, neurosurgeon, but uh, he did some essentials for this, as I will show later. So this is also a homunculus, uh, some artistic uh, picture of it. Just to see, uh, the biggest areas on this uh, slide are are the areas that are most innervated. So don't get confused. Okay, so now. Uh, the, these are some, just some of the, the quotes of him. The brain is the organ of destiny it holds within its humming mechanism secrets that will determine the future of the human race. And we can see uh, how many uh, the, the neuroscientific researches are, are today, uh, how, how important they are. We can see that this sense is, is preserved. People are thinking about brain today as well uh, in, this, in this manner. Uh, and also, he, here he is uh, describing his uh, one of his uh, anecdotes with the patient during uh, at, at the epilepsy surgery. When one of these flashbacks was reported to me by a conscious patient, it was incredible. For example, when a mother told me she was suddenly aware as my electrode touched the cortex of being in the kitchen listening to the voice of her little boy who was playing outside in the yard. These are these complex auras that he could provoke with brain stimulation. And uh, now, uh, let's just have another break in our presentation that will lead us into the more serious part of the presentation. OK. So, OK. So, let's start. Uh, OK, let's see what we got here. This is completely unethical. My hours are unethical. I don't have time to sit around searching tons of travel sites looking for flights and hotels. Just use Kayak and compare sites to travel sites in seconds. Well, I guess you're the brains of this operation. Compare hundreds of travel sites at once. Okay, so I put this in just to show you that uh, this is not brain surgery, okay? So uh, there are limitations to every method. So uh, although there, uh, there is uh, a wide amount of mapped areas of the cortex uh, 
neurosurgeons they are not uh, able to do anything so uh, I think this this video is really a comedy and, and it should be taken as that but it's it's kind of a very emphasized video on the social network so I wanted to put it for for uh, people who who will watch this later. So now we are back uh, in about 1920s, uh, and we are now viewing a scene from the operating hall of the Peter Brand Bryant Hospital, where Dr. Cushing is operating. He's on the top of the table. Uh, we will go into this into a bit more uh, more detail then, but I would just like you to to uh, see here that that uh, how sophisticated this looks even for this time so neurosurgery was was uh, only in its its uh, most most uh, essential and and developing days but uh, they already had a certain establishment of the operative theater and and uh, a ways to to operate these ways very very differ from the ways that are to used today but uh, it is very interesting to to uh, go back and try to understand how this was performed then. It was it was technologically much more complex than than it is now. Okay, this is also Dr. Cushing. You can see him now in in the job, a great man operating. So now uh, this is a, a kind of blurish picture, but it shows uh, Dr. Cushing writing down the procedure he just had. So he was very, very uh, disciplined in this way that he would always, after every every uh, sur surgery he w he has undertaken, he would sit down and write down all the important steps, and he would always illustrate this with the pictures that he was he considered the most important. Uh, Doctor Cushing uh, would use a medical illustrator, and he is one of the persons that are are uh, perhaps the most responsible for the establishment of medical illustrator as a profession. Uh, and uh, his work uh, also founded the first uh, medical illustrator school, school in Harvard, I think. So he was always, always uh, had had a medical in illustrator who uh, was there in the operating theater and would document all the procedures that he made. But also he himself would do this, and uh, he really left a, a large amount of material to be. Uh, taken uh, to, to see later. So this is Cleveland, uh, the birthplace of Professor Cushing. You can see now he, he was uh, born on April 8, 19, 1896. This is important. Here, is, here are just some pictures from his childhood, Professor Cushing as a child. Then with his family, this is uh, an older picture. He's not really a child, but this is his later family when he was married and, and having his children. He's here. So now, Professor Cushing uh, had a uh, few moments in his life. We can say that that kind of uh, very, very much influenced uh, who he will become. So this is one of the maybe most important uh, of these these moments. Uh, this is a picture from the Cleveland Manual Training School. Uh, this is the special kind of school that would uh, teach people, uh, teach children how to use their hands. And we can see all the all the kinds of, of instruments they have here. Uh, they had uh, all the kinds of manual uh, classes included in, into their standard program. And uh, Dr. Cushing himself uh, considered this to be a, a large, uh, large part of why he would become a neurosurgeon and why he would uh, become such a great neurosurgeon because uh, because of his manual dexterity. So now uh, he started uh, medical school at the Yale uh, School of Medicine, and then continued in Harvard, with, where he uh, graduated. So uh, Professor Cushing, as a medical student, was was very passionate, as as we can see from some reports and documents that that were left from from that time. He would also illustrate, and he started developing his illustrating skills from that time. So we can find uh, um, uh, some hernias uh, like uh, inguinal hernia that were, that were uh, pictured masterfully from him, or some other things like. Uh, 
some some endocrine problems which would which we can follow as part of his interest later. You all heard about Cushing's disease, so uh, I think he he really gathered knowledge and really tried to round himself up as a future professional. So then uh, he uh, had the opportunity and a great uh, great uh, happening that he met Dr. Halstead. William Stuart Halstead uh, introduced him to the Massachusetts General Hospital where he started his, his internship and then residency in general surgery uh, under Professor William Stuart Halstead. The neurosurgery as a specialty then did not exist, so he could not uh, take neurosurgery as, as, as his residency. So he was a general surgeon in his practice, in his uh, in his residency. So this is uh, Dr. Halstead, one of the great surgeons of all time also, who very much influenced Professor Cushing and he was really one of his fathers. And uh, this is one of the pictures that should be remembered during this presentation. I will tell you later why. But uh, a great man and he really was uh, a very kind friend, some, some uh, resources say, with Dr. Cushing who helped him through his career. Now, after this, uh, Dr. Cushing uh, went to Europe, where he studied with, with some great neurosurgeons of, ta of, of that time, and then uh, became an associate professor of surgery at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. This was uh, the first uh, time when, when Cushing really developed himself and really established as a person who would uh, make neurosurgery possible. So. Now we can see here the big four, or the, one of the most important professors who founded the, the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and who were also one of the people responsible for, for making uh, prolonged medical education or, or making residency possible. So uh, here is Harry Cushing, this is Osler is one of the leading internal medicine doctors of all time. He, he is a man who's, who is said to have uh, made medical students uh, study patient and his disease uh, beside his bed. So he, he, ha he may be called the father of clinical medicine, uh, clinical medicine teaching. And now this is William Tyre and this is Hallstedt sitting with him. So we can see the, the other people at the hall at that time. So this is about uh, the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Cushing, when he was young, I put this picture in because just to show you that he was uh, never a uh, crappy looking <laughs> student who, who was uh, really uh, shy and he, he had, had, this, uh, had this dandy look and uh, he always uh, did did have this uh, way of of making himself not just to look important but but to look uh, like a businessman and a reliable person so uh, he never looked bad <laughs> as a neurosurgeon this is also Cushing from these days one of the other pictures and then Cushing uh, met himself with, with a big problem. After he, he uh, started thinking about neurosurgery and, and the state that he, it was developed in, uh, he saw that one of the most important steps that should be undertaken are animal research. So he started to research the brain of the animals in various uh, models through the years. And before when, uh, going to the operative hall, he really started and, and tried to understand how the brain functions. So he started uh, working on dogs and uh, performed much experiments. Uh, these experiments included uh, following of, of, uh, of these dogs after certain uh, parts of the brain were removed. He inserted uh, glass parts so he can follow some of the functions. Uh, in in uh, the head of, of dogs and he really uh, after all performing all these uh, experiments he really provided the essentials for modern neurosurgery so this research was the basis of what we saw before this was the basis for Dr. Penfield in his later development of the cortical homunculus so we can uh, despite of all the things that Cushing accomplished and was part of 
uh, I was really uh, surprised when I saw that he was also part of the common cues, which is one of the maybe most important discoveries to make neurosurgery possible, not to mention functional neurosurgery and, and all the other developments that it made possible. This is again the picture of the homunculus uh, where we can see two most important gyri, post-central gy gyrus and uh, pre-central gyrus or M1 area and S1 area, sensory area, primary cortex and then the uh, motoric area, motor area, uh, primary cortex. Okay. And uh, now we will try to concentrate more on Cushing as a neurosurgeon. This is a picture of him operating. We can see uh, how how this was part of the routine. Uh, he's wearing. Uh, he really uh, looks like a neurosurgeon that that uh, would look today. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we can all see the passion he he felt for his job. Uh, how he was. Uh, how, how, how can I say it, how, how he was into this and how much he enjoyed performing this. So he, it was a matter of life and death to him and he really gave, gave his best all the time in during, doing neurosurgery. Okay, so uh, now uh, he, was, he was also <laughs> one of the people who are maybe responsible why neurosurgery is so slow as a specialty. Uh, there is a saying here in Zagreb that Everything you do in general surgery, you should do twice or th three times slower in neurosurgery. So uh, he was said to operate so slow that one one of the the attending surgeons at his place would ask him, "One, did you, did the tumor ever uh, return or reside dur during his operation?" Because he was said to to operate so slow that he the tumor really had the time to reappear during the operation. Uh, this is him with with his uh, colleagues uh, who assisted him there. These are one of uh, some of his residents later who would always do the craniotomy. So he's also responsible maybe for these early developments in surgery that can be seen today. He was doing the central part of the procedure not to uh, not to make himself too tired for this, and uh, he had uh, one resident open and one resident to close the wound after the operation. This is Cushing with Karlstedt also and uh, we can see how how this uh, relationship was, was very very intimate and, and supportive between them. Cushing holding a skull also <laughs> the important thing to see. And then uh, uh, one one of the with, with this all beautiful things happening in his life, he became the associate professor of neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins. He began developing neurosurgery. He invented all the basic procedures. We will see more of these uh, these uh, uh, these instruments that he invented later. But th these instruments were really the basis basis of, of modern neurosurgery, and lots of them are used today. So uh, then. Uh, one great rupture happened in this. Uh, the World War One became uh, started, and Cushing was also mobilized. So he he reported to serve his country uh, during the World War One, and he was set into Paris, uh, into France, where he served as a leading surgeon at one of the military hospitals. Okay, so this is Cushing in his military uniform. Okay. Uh, and he was positioned, uh, as I said, is, is uh, in uh, Paris. And during this time, he uh, Cushing experimented with electromagnets to try to uh, to take out uh, the bullets from the heads of the wounded soldier. Soldiers. So this is uh, really one one of the examples how Cushing was innovative and and uh, how much he would undertake to make surgery possible and and to help. So uh, Cushing, uh, after his service, he was honored by by some of the greatest honors uh, for his military surgeon uh, military service. He was made companion of the bath by the British government and received the Distinguished Service Medal by the USA. So he was very established as a soldier too. And he uh, gradually came to the rank of colonel. Then Professor Cushing uh, 
made lots and lots of, of uh, innovations in neurosurgery that really changed uh, the way this, this specialty was working. Uh, I would like to start to present this, this now and one of the most uh, interesting things he invented was the, was the use of x-rays in, in the operative uh, course of, of the patient. So he would use x-rays uh, to see what the pathology was. Uh, pneumoencephalography was then invented by Walter Dandy and uh, Cushing combined these methods to, to, uh, or, to orient himself. Uh, as you probably know, at that time CT was, was un unavailable. There was no CT, there was no magnetic resonance imaging. So uh, he really uh, used these methods to make the outcome of his surgery better and, and to, uh, to help his patients the most he had. So he used all the advanced technology that time. Uh, then uh, this is one, one of the interesting things. Uh, when uh, Cushing traveled a lot through Europe and uh, in one of his travels he went to Italy where he met, uh, met Scipione Rivarocci. Uh, he was the inventor of the Svidmo manometer and uh, while being in his uh, ambulance he saw this device and he was amazed uh, by how simple it was to measure blood pressure correctly with this device. He uh, asked uh, Riva Rochi to get one of his copies, one of copies to take to the USA. And uh, because Cushing uh, gradually became one of the most famous neurosurgeons of his time, uh, people would start to go to him. So he was he he said to have reversed the transatlantic uh, flow of, of brains and and medical special uh, specialists at that time. So uh, in the, in the first uh, years people would go from the USA to the Europe but then people from all sides of the world would go to the USA to see Cushing operating and uh, we will see uh, some of these people later and how he uh, there are certain anecdotes connected with this so uh, he, uh, while coming to him to visit him people uh, saw his copy of Sigma manometer and uh, this was uh, this is considered to be responsible for this for the dissemination of the Swigmund manometer through the world. So Cushing uh, is said to contribute to this also. I think this is really one of the amazing parts in, in uh, many of them. Uh, he also played a pivotal ro role in the development of the electrocautery. Uh, he was doing this with this man, this is uh, physicist Bowie, William Bowie, who uh, was uh, who was Cushing's friend and Cushing uh, asked him do, does he think there is a possibility a physical possibility to uh, coagulate uh, the wood to, to produce a current that would make something like this and uh, in co-working with, with uh, Bowie he invented the Bowie cutter this is the monopolar cutter that's used today in, mostly in general surgery but uh, this is uh, one of his most famous neurosurgical inventions. Uh, exactly neurosurgical because neurosurgery required more refined uh, tool to use in, in its operation. So this is the Cushing forceps or as we call it bipolar. So uh, bipolar has uh, this uh, plus and minus electrodes at the top and it's uh, it it is really uh, most uh, the the widely uh, most widely used tool in neurosurgery. It is used to coagulate fine vessels and for very fine meticulous surgery that is performed here. The electrical car current goes uh, through these two electrodes and uh, causes uh, denaturation of anything that is uh, between them. Uh, so then uh, Cushing really uh, using all this advanced technology he, he could make something possible that's even uh, a large step for uh, some surgeons today. He, uh, his mortality rate till 1920s was only 11 percent while other surgeons at that time were trying to achieve 40 percent. So we can see how successful he was in his uh, cases and uh, uh, how, how much he, he performed certain surger surgeries that other surgeons could not have performed at that time. Uh, 
So he was very important uh, in the development of neurosurgery and, and in the picture of sur surgery at that time. Uh, so now uh, one, one of uh, very very great illustrations of, of uh, who he was as a man I think is this picture here because he, we can see here the headlight the frontal light he, he was taking this is just an ordinary lamp he placed on his head the, the, today surgeons are using very refined lamps that could be fixed on your uh, scalp and and uh, you can see a great uh, have great lighting during the operation but he only it only took a cable and a lamp to put on his head and, and fix it and use this in the surgery so I really like this picture and I really think he tells a lot uh, who he was as, as a man and how fiercely uh, he, 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 were, he was performing surgery and, and developing neurosurgery so also, uh, Hushing may be uh, known for, for one of uh, large contributions he made to various medical specialties. As we saw, he, invent, he, uh, he participated in the dissemination of the Svigo manometer, but also uh, he was the first one, he was said to be the first one to classify, to make a classification of the brain tumors. Uh, so Cushing operated many brain tumors. As we will see later, uh, we will look at the video in which he operates his 2000th uh, pituitary tumor. But uh, do, doing all these tumors, Cushing never uh, just did the case and left it uh, behind himself. He always wrote down the description of the case, the case report, and illustrated this. And also took samples, pathological samples, that he can uh, preserve and that are preserved up to this date, as we will see later. So he really uh, made this this possible. Uh, one of his secretaries also, as you will see in the video, uh, was uh, uh, motivated with his work to go to medical school. She finished medical school and then became the brain pathologist. So he, she uh, really helped him and they had a, the whole institute there where they could diagnose the tumor during the operation and then uh, perform the operation of, of uh, removing the tumor or keeping parts of it uh, in, in uh, the patient if it was malignant. So uh, th this was really, really important and this was also a contribution to the development of surgery as we know it today. This is this collection of his tumors I was talking about. So he took whole uh, brains uh, in the abduction of, of the patient and he preserved them in, in this kex. So we can see how, how many of these tumors are here and, and how many of, of the uh, brain samples are here. So this is the picture of, of the Cushing uh, laboratory today that can be visited and it, is, it has been made publicly available. Now, uh, to break this, this perhaps uh, <laughs> boring part, uh, part that, that uh, was needed to, to uh, allow you to get a view of, of what Cushing was doing and how many, uh, how much things he contributed to medicine, uh, this is an anecdote that should break this uh, a little bit into uh, a funny anecdote. Uh, so, uh, I used to ask people here in Zagreb when I uh, had this lecture, uh, what do they think is inside of here? And they were saying probably like, uh, I don't know, like a brain tumor, part of the brain, maybe some other part of, of the body. But uh, what's inside is this. This is a beef steak. So, yeah, I know, I know it's hilarious. This is a beef steak. It's so. too big to be McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, too big for <laughs> Yeah, you can never, never stop your your hungry from <laughs> from the type of food they serve there. Okay, <laughs> but but uh, really, uh, this this was a beef steak. So uh, this is connected to this man Pavlov. Uh, he was one of the leading new neuro uh, physiologists of of that day, and and in the whole, uh, probably one of the greatest neurophysiologists uh, of all time. Uh, he he's the man who who was said to invent uh, to to uh, discover the way the brain functions. So he uh, he was the the man who uh, discovered classic conditioning and oper operational conditioning uh, with dogs with who he 
experimented. So the Paolo, Paolo's dog is very uh, famous for this. And we can see how close Paolo and Cushing were. This is a picture from the conference uh, that was uh, that uh, was uh, in 1929, uh, the World Congress of Physiologists in the USA. So uh, Paolo was the lion of the Congress. He was one of the most important persons there, and everybody was very eager to meet him. But Paolo did uh, would hang out the most with Cushing, who was very interested to him because he was a real neurosurgeon, and Paolo was very interested in how neurosurgery was done. He he had really little knowledge about this because neurosurgery was not so developed in other parts of the world. Uh, so they made kind of a deal uh, to uh, uh, Paolo Vaz Cushing if he could see his operation, and uh, because he was he was very very interested as we can see, as you will see later. These are just two of them, two of great physiologists hanging out. Uh, Cushing, may, we may also say that Cushing is one of the physiologists because as he commented later. Uh, the one thing I uh, I really uh, uh, am sad the most about my friends, the physiologists, is that they have no sense of history, <laughs> because all they was they were interested in was science. But uh, and uh, the uh, Pavlov himself never documented as much as Cushing did. Uh, Cushing was obsessed kind kind of with with the documentation of his work because he probably knew that uh, he was doing pioneering things that would mean a lot later. So uh, there are really, uh, really, uh, maybe no one in, in the history who has so much documents on his work as, as Cushing, because he documented every uh, single operation he had, every every uh, great thing that he, that he has done. Uh, this is uh, to, to present you Pavlov uh, in his work. He was working on dogs and uh, this is him with, with his team in Russia doing one of these experiments. So a great, great scientist and neurophysiologist. Uh, and then uh, Pavlov, uh, because he was Russian, I don't know is, uh, is this uh, because of this, but, but uh, he, could, he could never really put his beard into the surgery mask he was wearing. So his beard, he was so interested in the, when viewing uh, Cushing operated that it is said that his beard almost fell into the surgical uh, area. So he, he should have been very cautious about this. Uh, this is Cushing explaining to him with his headlight. Uh, about the operation he is performing, and, and Paulo almost tripped over to, <laughs> to fell down. And uh, during one of these procedures, uh, now we will return to the beef steak. Uh, during one of these procedures, uh, Paulo uh, saw Cushing use uh, his uh, electrocautery, uh, which he called the the electrical knife. So uh, Paulo was so amazed with this instrument that he asked Cushing, could he could he try it? And Cushing said, yes, no problem. And after the surgery, he uh, came back to Paolo with a lump of beef meat. And Paolo, uh, Paolo uh, wrote with, with this electric knife uh, his name into this lump of meat. So this is why, why this is called the Paolo beefsteak. Uh, and we can see here Paolo reading on it. And really, if, if uh, you uh, this uh, exists today too, and it can be seen in this lump of meat, uh, the autogram of uh, Ivan <laughs> of Pablo. So th this is one of the most interesting stories that that they uh, that he has. Also, uh, as I said, uh, Cushing reversed this transatlantic traveling of physicians, and while the physicians would come to him. Uh, he had uh, uh, one typical routine uh, of of uh, going around with them. So uh, he would invite uh, these great surgeons, uh, such as Halstead or or anyone, Horsley maybe, from from all the parts of the world, and he would uh, dandy. He would walk with them, and uh, after during their walk, talking about uh, wake, uh, during their walking, talking about various things. They would eventually come to a small set of shops, uh, and Cushing would say to him, "Well, this looks uh, like a very nice shop. Should we go inside?" And they would go inside, uh, and it would be uh, a shop that uh, was making jewelry. 
and uh, the jeweler came to the surgeon and, and said, Oh, you, sir, uh, I, I couldn't help to notice you have such great hands. They are so beautiful. Uh, I, you know, I'm, you must be a surgeon. And he said, yes. How did you, how did you do, know that I'm a surgeon? He says, oh, I, I always uh, no, notice who is a surgeon because, uh, from the way his lo hands look. So, uh, you know, I'm collecting the casts of hands of famous surgeons. So if you, were, you would be willing, I would be very glad to take a cast of your hands. This, this surgeon would probably look at Cushing, uh, asking him why, or why, what is this man talking about? But Cushing would encourage him and they would both make uh, this cast of hand. So this is Cushing's cast of hand. And uh, eventually, uh, of course, these casts of hands would, were delivered to Dr. Cushing. So he really made uh, every surgeon who, who visited him has his own cast preserved in, in Cushing collection. So I think this is amazing, uh, an amazing story also <laughs> showing he's interested in preservation of historical facts of happenings and uh, he's very, very responsible for uh, history of medicine also, development of this, as we can see from, from these things. Uh, this is Cushing in his later years uh, when he was uh, the professor also there. Uh, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he was at that time uh, performing surgery at the Peter Ben Bryan uh, in the operating theater as, as we can see later. And uh, Cushing is probably the most known for his work in the endocrine uh, medicine. So uh, he is the one to describe Cushing's disease. Uh, and uh, he really was able to describe this because he performed so many pituitary tumors. So he, so he exactly knew what was happening when there was a tumor producing uh, uh, adrenocorticotropins and, and uh, that would stimulate the adrenal glands to produce cortisol and that would make uh, the classical clinical image of Cushing's disease. Uh, so this is just a picture resembling all, all uh, the facts about it. Uh, so <laughs> this is a, a very interesting disease because it's so it has so so much involved. It's uh, it is a syndrome, and uh, also one of the diseases, as one of my professors would say, uh, one of the diseases that you can see when a patient enters your door. It's really uh, one of the rare examples of inspection in medicine. How you can diagnose something purely with inspection. It, without any other physical examination methods. So, uh, then Cushing, uh, Cushing was uh, doing his surgeries, as I said, he always had a medical illustrator. And this is one of the most, uh, the latest, the, the uh, most last parts that I would like to uh, take your, uh, to, to tell you. Uh, so he always had one of the great uh, medical illustrators with him who would illustrate the whole procedure. Uh, Brittle was one of them. He was a famous, famous uh, illustrator who would found the Harvard School of Medical Illustrations. That was that is so that exists uh, today also. Uh, Brittle illustrations were so incredible that re they really looked like a photograph, doing the only in black and white. But they also included this 3D uh, sensation, and uh, they were they were really something beyond everything, everything that Cushing himself could do. So Cushing's illustrations were, were very simple. He would do this uh, like uh, sketches that would resemble the most important parts. But uh, he really valued uh, illustrations because they would always uh, they would always uh, show you. What's the most important, the most important part of the picture? They, they would. Uh, he was doing these sketches to show the others what he was thinking about when viewing this specific uh, case. Uh, but Brittle would show all of this and in such detail that it was unbelievable. Uh, after Cushing and Brittle were separated, when Cushing. Uh, was uh, Cushing went to the World War One, and he really never could uh, find someone uh, like Brittle. So after a period of adaptation, Cushing started uh, illustrating himself and developing his illustration skills. And going from from 
only only the false sketches that probably everyone who with a bit of talent could make. He uh, proceeded to become himself one of the great, uh, maybe greatest illustrators in medicine. This is a picture that looks most uh, like like uh, the illustration that Brittle would would do. You can see how how precise this is. Uh, all the layers of the wound are shown here. You can s see so much from this picture. It is not. It is a bit blurry, so we cannot see here. But but uh, this is the primary motor strip, and uh, here he's showing the mapping of the cortex. So this picture binds maybe all of of the things Cushing has done in neurosurgery together, because you can see how clean this cut is. The, the dural opening, everything is in its place, the, the burr holes, and uh, also uh, this is probably, uh, th this resembles greatly also the, the homunculus and, and brain mapping that he was doing. And uh, in fact this person that he was uh, picturing didn't have the face like this. Uh, you could say uh, how, how could he uh, picture someone the face of his patient, uh, how could he, he get the, the consent to do this? But uh, he uh, was very intelligent and he, he kind of uh, made this, this uh, procedure. He, he always uh, would make the face of the person look different. So he added moustache musta to this person. And when we look at this, uh, this picture really uh, reminds us of someone. So we can say that this reminds us of, of Hallstedt or some other uh, mentors of Cushing. And there was one other person who is uh, considered to maybe uh, had, have had this face. Uh, this is Cushing's brother. So uh, Cushing would, would uh, give this uh, uh, latent message in this. And uh, we can see how, how his work is, is filled with this, this little astonishing things that that really uh, talk about him as a man I think and, and show us who, who he was also coaching after every surgery that he did uh, would have this routine he would sit and read till 8 uh, to 10 p.m. he was such a patient a passionate bibliophile uh, that he all also through, throughout his whole, li whole life collected rare books of, of medicine and uh, his collection was so big uh, after he retired that uh, the Yale University Medical Library was made with the foundation of his books. He, he gave all of his books to his university and we can see how, how this looks today. So really a uh, vast, vast amount of books that were collected and uh, also preserved by Cushing. He had uh, Vesalius and his anatomy books, uh, Eustachie and, and all the other uh, great anatomists and, and their works. So after all of this, when Cushing retired, uh, he kind of uh, went away in neurosurgery when he was at the top of his game, as it, is, it was said. So uh, he didn't want to see his career go into waste. And uh, he, after that, became uh, the Sterling Professor of Neurology at the Yale Medical School. And then, uh, I don't think, know if this is ironical, I, I wouldn't say that, but in 1939, on October 9, Cushing himself died of complications from the myocardial infarction. And, and the ironical part of this is that the abdu abduction of, of Professor Cushing revealed that he has arachnoid cyst, that he has had an arachnoid cyst in his brain, probably his whole life. So <laughs> it's it's very very interesting, uh, and I also put here uh, the the one of the facts from his life that I mentioned that he was married to Catherine Stone Corwell, uh, and he had five children with, with her uh, as we saw in the previous picture. This is the gravestone of Dr. Cushing, and this is uh, the banner that that is uh, at his grave site, uh, telling us uh, some of the things that I said. Pioneer brain surgeon and author, he developed techniques for brain and nervous system operations such as local anesthetic, the tourniquet, heart pressure, and oxygen level monitoring. He still put the prize in 1926 for the biography of Sir William Mosley. And I don't I don't know if you're surprised now 
but I didn't want to mention this uh, until this slide. So Cushing also received Pulitzer Prize for his work uh, on the biography of Sir William Mosler, who he knew very well. He, Cushing is also said to have treated neurosurgically his daughter, Mosler's daughter, uh, and I think he tried to save uh, Osser's son, something like that, in in uh, World War One. So they were very, very connected, and uh, he he really <laughs> made all these things happen. Now at the end, uh, and we can see here uh, the one of the founding sessions after the Cushing, uh, the Harvey Cushing Society was was made. So this is this is the first session of the Harvey Cushing Society with Harvey Cushing sitting in the middle. So uh, after uh, this organization was uh, renamed into American Association of Neurological Surgeons and this is one of the biggest and the most important organizations of neurological surgery that exists today. And uh, there is also an anecdote connected to this but you will see this in a video that will, that will uh, shortly go uh, after this slide. So uh, just to uh, tell you one more impression about Cushing. One, now that we know all the contributions he has made, how he, his life uh, looked, uh, I would just like to tell you the opinion of one of, of uh, the persons who, kno who knew him. Uh, this person stated that Cushing was looking as one of the most intelligent people that you would uh, see. He was very calm and, and very tactical in, in his communications. But despite of this, uh, he is also uh, being said to be a very hard, hard, complex person that uh, really uh, not many people could understand. So he was considered a, a tough character at that time and is considered today. But uh, I would now like to, like to ask you a question after all of this that we, that we saw. Uh, could a man of such innovation, of such hu humor in his work, could, be, uh, could he be so hard? He was maybe complex, but I don't think that he was really uh, so hermetic and, and uh, unbearable. But uh, also the video that we, we will see later uh, will show us <laughs> some, some of these uh, character uh, trails that, that really uh, <laughs> might argue that he, he really was. He tried to block the view of the camera, even though he, he, uh, he knew that he will be uh, taped. He tried to block the view of the camera with his shoulders three, three times, I think. So, <laughs> really, the, the, he was a unique character. And then, uh, after all of this, I would like to take you through this video. I don't know, uh, maybe we can stop the presentation now and have a little discussion about it. Because uh, And we can see the view video later because I, I really think you, you must be tired. And, <laughs> no, no, that's, that's the flower. It's a great, uh, great presentation. Thank you for taking the time. Just get off the screen share there, Slavin, yes, yes. so we can talk to yes. you personally. Yes. Thank you very much for for the effort. Excellent presentation. So a fascinating individual. Uh, obviously, very dedicated. And we're joined by uh, Suresh Dugani, I believe mm -hmm. the name. Uh, Suresh, is that the correct name that I'm getting? Can you hear me okay? Mm, no, I think this is okay, Rakesh. Well, okay, we'll continue on. Uh, okay. Anyways, yeah, there's a couple of questions uh, I have. Mm -hmm. um, boy, he did a lot, and I'm probably like most doctors and most people in the medical profession. Everybody knows Cushing disease, but I had no idea he was a neurosurgeon. Uh, and there's one thing you didn't mention in neurosurgery, there's a Cushing reflex. And perhaps Simon knows about yes, that. Yes, yes, perhaps, yes. Perhaps, oh. uh, maybe you could yeah, explain yeah. what that is. Uh, you fun. know, just just uh, the other day I asked one of my professor, professors about this reflex because there was a very, very interesting talk on Nature I had with Simon uh, about one case that had increased uh, intracranial pressure. And uh, I, I asked him, uh, could uh, Cushing reflex uh, raise the intracranial pressure even more? But my professor said no, it, it doesn't uh, make the, the, the pressure go up, it makes the pressure go down. And this is very interesting, but because Cushing's, uh, Cushing reflex 
is uh, one of the, the reflexes that occur when uh, severe brain ischemia occurs. Yes. So uh, when there is not enough perfusion uh, in the brain or when the, when the uh, ICP increases so much that it pressures, uh, that it makes it impossible for the cerebral blood flow to, to occur, uh, then the sympathetic nerves stimulate, are stimulated so much that the pressure, blood pressure goes up, they really stimulate the heart to its boundaries. And the pressure goes up and makes this blood flow possible. Mm -hmm. So this goes intermittently until the blood flow is established enough to, to, uh, to not have ischemia occur. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you. Thank you for mentioning this. This is really one of the spectacular uh, discoveries that Kushin made. And I'm really glad that he was a neurosurgeon, a person who really uh, understood these things and, and uh, use them daily uh, to describe one of these things and uh, really, really a great remark. Thank you. Okay, Simon, do you have some questions? Thank you very much, Lavin. Uh, yeah, thank you for all of my medical school career. I'll look at the class. We're well, having a hard time with your sound, Simon. I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't know what's, what's wrong. Something's wrong with the sound. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to type the question in, Simon, I'll ask it. You know, one thing I'll remark while Simon's straightening out his uh, typing a question um, is that uh, uh, anesthesia was invented in Boston, matter of fact. I don't know if it was at Peter Ben yeah. Graham or, or approximately the same time. Uh, now, I don't know if the craniotomy, craniotomy we saw where the patient was awake, if that was an awake craniotomy. But uh, can, you, can you remark on that when anesthesia was invented? It was around in Boston. Around that same time. Yeah, you know, uh, the anesthesia was, was uh, in fact invented in the 19th century, in 1846. Oh, okay. Years. So, so uh, really, uh, there, there is, uh, you, you, th this is also a great remark because in the Massachusetts General Hospital, that, there is the Ether Dome. And uh, right. this is the place, one of the old surgical theaters that were not sterile. Uh, the, the only the, the uh, methods of, of uh, asepsis and, and the preservation from infection were introduced later, much later than, than the anesthesia was, was introduced. So uh, this was the place where, where uh, ether was the was first time used to successfully anesthetize the patient. And it is said to, to have been like this. And uh, in Britain, one of the surgeons, this is a story from, from Great Britain, in fact, but when one of the uh, great surgeons there used this to operate a young waiter who was waiting for his operation, and at and that time, uh, surgery was horror. You know, uh, there, there is uh, very, pretty much uh, very, very, uh, not, not too much text describing this. But some people did manage to share their experiences about the surgery before the onset of anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was so, so terrifying that, that it, it could only be described as a hell on earth. So uh, one of the professors uh, of mathematics, I think, described his uh, disarticulation of the, of the uh, uh, foot joint. Uh, it was it was performed by the famous surgeon Syme himself, who invented this procedure. But uh, he, it was it was such a excruciating experience that he really uh, described it as as the feeling of of being left by the god, by by life and and uh, his fellow men. So surgery was was very fast at that time. And this yeah. is also a thing that I would like to say. Uh, it, it, it took only about 10 seconds. And Cushing was uh, really the first one to, to start uh, operating a long time and taking his time to make uh, patients uh, to, to perform better surgeries that were more precise. So uh, in Great Britain, the experience that I was talking, uh, just to, to close this, uh, when this waiter was operated, uh, he, when the ether was administered, he fell asleep so, so fast and uh, woke up. Uh, when, when he woke up, he said, uh, are you going to start? And the operation was already finished. So this was the, probably the, the, the greatest uh, example of that ether really worked and, and that uh, it really served as an anesthesia. So uh, okay. really, really a great story. And, and uh, they say that this is 
perhaps the most groundbreaking discovery in, in the in medicine. It's certainly in surgery uh, because okay, surgery I, was quite impossible until that time. Okay, I'd like to say hello to Bernardo de Andrada from Rio de Janeiro. He joined us. And uh, Bernardo, maybe you can uh, remark on, uh, Slavin just gave an excellent presentation of the life of Harvey Cushing, who, who uh, uh, I didn't even know that he was a neurosurgeon, but apparently uh, he's had some uh, influence, heavy influence on neurosurgery. Of course, he's the one with the Cushing reflex. And are you familiar with Henry, uh, Harvey Cushing at all, Bernardo? Yes, yes, but not not so much. But I mm -hmm. I know something about his his history. He dis he was uh, if I'm not wrong, he, he was the first to localize a function on the brain mm -hmm. on on right. a brain surgery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Slavin yes, uh, was course. talking about that. The, the humunculus. He uh, uh, kind of mapped the brain. He was one yes. of the mappers of the brain, right? Slavin? Yeah, yeah, he did a uh, transesphenoidal surgery, pituitary surgery, so another many things he he could he bring to the neurosurgery. Yes, okay. uh, this is a great remark, uh, Dr. Andrada. I'm very glad to meet you uh, because we, uh, I would like to invite you all now uh, to to view a short video. It's about 15, 20 minutes that uh, was provided by the ANS. Uh, that uh, shows us uh, Cushing doing his transtemporal approach to, to treat the tumor of the hypothesis. Okay. So this is uh, nice. Okay, well, we, Simon, okay. what would you like to do, Simon? Because Simon's the editor here. Uh, should we okay. watch the video now, or you want to place it in later? Or now? Okay. Whatever you want to do, Slavin, that's fine. Okay. Uh, so the video is narrated. Uh, I think I put the video here because it really is is the the most important part of this presentation. I really wanted you to see pushing operating and and it's so such an important uh, document, medical document, uh, to see him operating one of the greatest surgeons of all time. Uh, and I think you'll enjoy it. So, so uh, I just wanted to say uh, another great remark uh, from Dr. Andrada was this uh, mapping. I, I really wanted to to um, to make you see how how important this was because he uh, he was the, the first one to make the essentials needed for yes. this. And it was needed for neurosurgery because without knowing of what cortex was, was doing, what what was the function of certain area. You could not perform any any approach through the cortex uh, because so he invented kind of started uh, to invent the the uh, eloquent and non-eloquent area system that was used at that time. Uh, today it is said that there are no eloquent and non-eloquent areas. The whole brain is uh, eloquent, but uh, really. Uh, at that time, surgery was performed through the non-eloquent areas or the areas that would not produce any neurological deficit that was viewable. And uh, this was this was probably needed to be because of of the time, because it was more more important to uh, make a patient live and survive from a pathology than than to uh, you know make his his surgery. Uh, so. Yes. So, to avoid so, disabilities. Yes, to avoid disabilities. Okay, so if you're ready, uh, let's proceed to this video. I will oh, start okay. sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you agree? Okay, okay. Okay. So, uh, I'm screen sharing now, okay. So, uh, let's go now to this. This is a video provided by the ANS, and they have all the rights uh, of it, but it can be seen on YouTube, but uh, I really uh, would like to express again my gratitude uh, for, for, uh, this, for making this video publicly available, and, and I really think you will enjoy it now. I will now give the word to the, uh, uh, to, to the narrator. narrator.
this binds together the whole presentation. The film opens as Dr. Gilbert Horak starts the injection of Novocaine along the line of the scalp incision. Most of the craniotomies of this time were done under local anesthesia, sometimes supplemented by open mask ether or by nitrous oxide. Also, since 1926, an anesthetic drug called Aberton was administered rectally as a basal narcotic, but anesthesia by intubation was never employed. This film of Dr. Cushing and his surgical team at the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital in Boston was made by two amateur movie makers, Walter Boyd, a surgical house officer, and Richard Light, who held the Cabot Fellowship in the Laboratory for Surgical Research at Harvard. They used two cameras and combined the results into a single film. As far as we know, this is the only record on film that was ever made of a complete Cushing operation. I am speaking in the year 1979, almost half a century after the event took place. During this interval, all of the men trained by Cushing have completed their careers and have retired. The last of his surgical residents, Bronson Ray, ended his own surgical practice just two years ago. The film, therefore, has become an important historical document. In Cushing's time, the operating rooms at the Brigham Hospital were pleasant, open places. Constructed in 1912, they drew their light from the high, north-facing studio windows and their ventilation, at least when the weather was warm, by opening those windows. The sounds and the smells of the street drifted in, and we recall one day when two small boys climbed up into one of the poplar trees just outside the windows to get a good view of all that was going on. When Dr. Cushing arrived to take over the operation, he apparently did not see the boys, although everyone else was aware of their presence and was wondering what would happen. When he uncovered the brain, the boy's excitement gave them away. The chief walked over to the window and looking over his glasses said very sternly, if you boys cannot keep quiet, I shall have to send you home. Needless to say, they became silent and stayed on until the end. Invited visitors were many and a crude movable iron stand gave a good view of the proceedings. Over the years, many of the medical leaders of Europe had stood in these stands, including the Russian physiologist Pavlov, whose long beard, since he refused to wear a full mask, almost touched the open wound. Dr. Cushing was tolerant of these visitors, just as he was patient with the rotation of house officers who appeared, a new one every six weeks, to handle the large assortment of instruments used during the operation. He was one of our great teachers, and you can sense this in the calm, practiced movements of the members of the operating team as they go about the business of this day's surgical removal of yet another brain tumor. this husky man of German descent named Adolf, who may well have been an arrested acromegalic. He ruled over the operating room like a master sergeant in a boot camp. We'll see how During his you, final you years, Dr. Cushing look. concentrated on brain tumors, leaving the rest of the field of neurosurgery to his associate, Gilbert Horax. The usual operating schedule was one brain tumor per day, Monday through Saturday. Dr. Horax performed the opening stage, as shown here, which took about an hour and a quarter. Then Dr. Cushing took over for the tumor removal, with Horax coming back to do the closure. On this day, however, because of the cameras and the special occasion of the 2000th tumor, Dr. Cushing stayed on to complete the operation and to apply the post-operative dressing. These operations covered four to seven hours, longer than they do today. Hemostasis, mostly the control of oozing from small veins, was what took up so much time. The introduction of clotting agents, such as gel foam and purified thrombin, was still a dozen years away. 
This technique of turning back an osteoplastic flap was fairly standard then, although it is less used today. Four or five burr holes were drilled. A beveled saw cut was made from within outward on all but one side, and forcible breakage of the temporal bone laid back the flap. Then the operative field was made dry. The wound was covered with warm saline sponges, and Dr. Horrocks departed while Dr. Cushing prepared to take over. So, craniotomy was very different at that time, as you can see here. Yes, yes, it's a great video. Mm -hmm. So, very, very complicated and, and uh, required lots of skill and force, as he said, because there, there must have been green stick fracture of, of uh, temporal bone. I'm not sure if this is transtemporal approach, but uh, it, it seems like that it isn't, but uh, we can see the, the technique that they use. Walter Boyd operating his Bell and Howell camera from a position in the visitor stands. And now the big man. Dr. Cushing, right? Cushing had an understandable dislike yes. for the bloody practices still seen then in German operating rooms where surgeons wore rubber boots and rubber aprons simply to keep dry. Dr. Cushing. Cushing's team wore white shoes, immaculate reminders of the careful hemostasis which was expected of everyone. Dr. Cushing's reaction to the cameras was a mixture of tolerance and impatience. The photography was done with his permission, of course, but the details bothered him and he tried to control the scene taking. When he felt that something was unimportant, such as the scrub up, he tried to stop the cameras and several times he deliberately blocked the view of the operative site with his shoulders. However, this did him little good, for whenever the view from one camera was blocked, the other camera took over. He soon caught on to this and gave up. At the end of the operation, Dr. Cushing wadded up a wet sponge and threw it at my head, remembering perhaps the years when he played shortstop on the Yale baseball team. So now Cushing is operating. Uh, I, uh, you can see his technique, how flawless it is, and, and really like great neurosurgeons and professors today, as we can see in the operating halls. A tour of the pituitary, although devastating in its biological effects and the damage that it does to vision, is usually quite small and is therefore difficult to demonstrate in pictures such as these. You will have to take my word for it that the tumor was located and that its removal was accomplished. Cushing employed a full-time medical artist named Mildred Cotting, whose excellent illustrations are to be found in all of his publications from the mid-twenties onward. She had trained with Max Brutal, the great teacher in medical illustration at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. As I mentioned in the presentation, Brittle was, was his, her mentor and she uh, was an artist that uh, was illustrating Cushing's uh, operations at that time, after Brittle. Another invaluable assistant was Louise Eisenhardt, who had taken up the work of the Neuropathological Laboratory after Percival Bailey left for Chicago. Originally, she was Dr. Cushing's secretary, but she had later gone through medical school and trained in pathology 
to become a specialist in the differentiation of brain tumors. She co-authored with Cushing the large monograph on the meningiomas. After his retirement, Louise Eisenhardt directed the Cushing Brain Tumor Registry in New Haven. She also served as the editor of the Journal of Neurosurgery from its first issue in 1944 until 1965, an editorial labor of 22 years. So they had the whole institute there, and they could diagnose the tumor intraoperatively. So they do a frozen section during the operation and identify the tumor? Yes, I think they did. They did. Okay. Okay, this is, uh, I don't know if this is Cushing for forceps. The electrical forceps. contact, mm -hmm. of course, was made through whichever hemostat or forceps was holding the bleeding vessel. This modern version of medieval cautery, developed at Harvard, had been available to neurosurgeons only since 1927 and was invaluable in controlling small vessel bleeding in deep holes. General surgeons who are watching this picture may be wondering about the sponge count for those small cotton pledges that were used to soak up fluids and were often pushed into corners and left there for a time to control bleeding. Well, there wasn't any practical method of counting those elusive things, although nowadays they are attached to threads. The nurse made up a good supply in advance and continued to replenish the supply all through the operation. So a vigilant watch was kept by the surgical assistant to ensure that none of them was left behind when the wound was closed. And this led to some anxious moments. On one occasion, during an operation on a cerebellopontial tumor, Dr. Cushing had inserted a pledget of cotton in the angle, and the assistant had not seen him take it out. He began to worry about it, but only after the chief had closed the dura, the muscle, the subcutaneous fascia, and the skin with his usual meticulous care, did he summon up the courage to say, Dr. Cushing, did you mean to leave that piece of cotton in the angle? Without a word, Dr. Cushing picked up the scissors and removed every stitch, looked up in the angle, removed the piece of cotton, and closed the wound again, layer by layer. The unhappy resident who told this story went on to say, a few days later, we did another posterior fossa tumor, and Dr. Cushing again put a piece of cotton into the angle to control the oozing. I kept my eye on that cotton for four and one half hours, and again hesitated on the verge of calling it to Dr. Cushing's attention until the last stitch had been put in. Just as before, Dr. Cushing reopened the incision painstakingly, looked at the angle, and what do you think he saw? The resident groaned. There was not a thing there. So he was very patient. Uh, very, very patient. Well, you know, most surgeons I run into are. Mm -hmm. They have to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At this time, the training centers for medicine and surgery were relatively few in number, and the appointments were highly prized. In the three major Boston hospitals, all of which were connected with medical schools, competitive examinations were given. The applicants were required to be single, and it was understood that marriage would not take place until the full training was completed. The starting salary was $300 per year for house officers, and rose to a handsome $1,800 at the resident level. How things have changed. Today's resident can demand as much as $18,000 a year. Yes, uh, he, he had a contract for his res residents uh, saying not to marry through, during their training. So this is very interesting. He wanted them to, to full time. Of closing the wound goes on, 
Let us consider the wide-ranging influence that Harvey Cushing exerted during the last half of his career. His reputation had been building for a long time, growing stronger with each resident set out to establish neurosurgery in this or that medical center, and with each publication of new advances in technique, or in wisdom, or sometimes simply in courage, that he made in this largely unknown field of surgery. Numerous honorary degrees were now coming to him, including the Doctor of Science, which was awarded by Harvard University two months after this operation. Later that same summer, at the first International Neurological Congress held in Switzerland, the ovation given Dr. Cushing was so great that William Henry Welch, who took part in the Congress, said to a friend, Cushing is undoubtedly the outstanding medical figure of the world today. Harvey Cushing was one of the reasons why the transatlantic movement of medical men reversed itself. In earlier years, young American physicians had flocked to Europe, as he himself had done, to sharpen their skills under the famous leaders of the time. Now Europe was turning to America, coming over in droves to the teaching centers in this country. By the end of his career, more than a dozen Cushing-trained men were practicing neurosurgery in Europe and the British Isles, and at least two dozen others in the United States and in Canada. Contributing to the importance of American training centers was the growth of experimental laboratories in our medical schools. Here again, Cushing had been a pioneer, and his biographer, John Fulton, states that one of his most significant contributions to American surgery lay in the establishment in 1901 of the Hunterian Laboratory at the Johns Hopkins Medical School. The Hunterian was destined to become the forerunner of all other ex experimental laboratories, including the Laboratory for Surgical Research here at Harvard. The Harvard Laboratory stood across the street from the Brigham Hospital. Since Cushing controlled the appointment of its director, much of the research of the laboratory moved along as the, the same direction as the studies on humans which derived from his surgical practice. Thus the Cushing team was broader in scope than the gowned and gloved people seen in these pictures. It was a concerted enterprise, driving steadily forward through research and development and on into publication. The published works of Harvey Cushing fill several feet of bookshelf space. The earliest, and one of the most famous of his monographs, was called The Pituitary Body and Its Disorders, which grew out of the Harvard Lecture which he gave in New York in 1910. Since the pituitary is one of the most complex of the glands of internal secretion, the unraveling of its secrets, and of its several types of tumors, occupied Cushing until the end of his days. Not all of his writing was in the field of science, however. His two-volume biography of William Osler, which appeared in 1925, won worldwide attention, and it included a Pulitzer Prize. In addition to his practice in neurosurgery and to his writings, Cushing was a persistent and tireless collector of early medical books and pamphlets. These treasures he bequeathed to Yale University, which built a special library to house them. When the list of his rare books was finally released by Yale, a British reviewer called it the greatest collection of books left by a medical man since William Hunter willed his great collection to the University of Glasgow in 1783. To accomplish so much in a single lifetime is one of the marvels of his career, since he carried on the life of a surgeon, the life of a bibliophile, and the life of a writer in different parts of the same day. He was at the hospital from nine in the morning until 5.30 or six o'clock in the afternoon without a luncheon break because he had tea and toast in the dressing room while dictating the operating notes. His writing was done at home in the evenings. He often had a staff members come for dinner with his family, but around eight o'clock he skillfully ushered us out of the house and then retired to his study to work over books and papers until midnight. His working day covered 13 or 14 hours out of the 24.
As the surgical drapes are laid back, we can see how little of present-day technology was in use then. None of the expensive and complicated life support mechanisms that we know now had yet been developed. The only systemic monitor was a woman anesthetist buried under the drapes, sitting on a low stool, who checked on blood pressure and pulse and respiration, and occasionally administered a whiff of ether or of gas. The surgeon of 1930 was like the airplane pilot of the same time, who had to rely on experience and judgment because there was no other technology with which to find his way from here to there. The most serious deficiency of the time was the lack of blood bank and the inability to administer fluids and drugs continuously into a vein. Fluids were given, if at all, by insertion of a long needle into the deep tissues of the thigh. Transfusions were made direct from donor to receiver in what was often a desperate last minute attempt to save an expiring patient. Most operative infections, however, were virtually unknown. The discipline of the operating room was never broken, and its philosophy was written on the wall of the surgical laboratory. In this room, it said, godliness is next to cleanliness. And for a reminder, there was a stiff brush fastened to the wall in case anyone needed to scratch his face. The long hours of open wound exposure, the lack of filtered air, the open balconies, the entrance and exit of many people, None of these modern horrors had any damaging effect on the Halstead principles of tissue handling as they had been preserved and elaborated on by this pupil. Dr. Cushing's results were indeed marvelous. When he entered the field of neurosurgery, the operative mortality for brain tumors was well over 70%. By 1920, he had lowered his own surgical mortality to 20%. By 1929, to 10%. And then, on the final stretch, down to 4%. No one could do it any better today. One of Cushing's many talents was his ability to sketch, and his case histories are generously illustrated with pen and ink drawings made as soon as the operation was finished, which show the various stages of the procedure. These were useful later on as he worked up the cases for publication, and they were also helpful when patients came back for further surgery. This short ceremony had been planned for weeks in anticipation of his performing the 2000th brain tumor operation. Although Cushing's operative career still had a year and a quarter to run, a special demonstration seemed appropriate to this occasion. We do not have a record of what the speaker said, but no one could say it better than John Holmans, who had worked with Cushing since his work at the Ontario in 1908, and who spoke with a cheerful and bunch of frankness that everyone enjoyed. I am sure that he said just the right things to make Dr. Cushing feel good. This is the the, uh, the silver cigarette box that every president of the ANS had since then. Give me the beef. <laughs> Part of each four examination of the patients has been operated on during the preceding six or eight days. Dr. Cushing usually took care of this himself. The patients were brought back to the operating room not on stretchers, but in their own beds, with their heads turned to the foot of the bed. The journey was made over a long pike, open to the weather, 
with two or three people hugging and pushing the clanking beds along on their wobbly casters. Once in the operating room, however, things were quiet, as always. One by one, the dressings were removed and the surgical needle laid bare. Sutures were cut on the second day and left in place to be removed on the day following. Back in 1905, when Cushing first turned his attention to the surgery of the brain and the spinal cord, he requested that all of his patients write to him on the anniversary of their operations. This practice enabled him to collect data concerning the end results of his surgery and ultimately determine the probable life expectancy of patients having a particular type of tumor. At the time of his death in 1939, he was still following nearly a thousand of his living cases of verified brain tumor. What better indication could there be of the dedication of this great physician to his work and to his patients? Well, very good, Slavin. I think we're going to wrap it up now. Uh, I, I just have to ask Bernardo a question, and, and maybe you could help me answer it too, uh, Slavin. Was it was it Bernardo? Are, are neurosurgeons noted for being slow operators? Because I, I don't think you were here when uh, Slavin was talking about it, but he mentioned that Dr. Cushing operated very slowly and meticulously. Well, I guess... Bernardo's gone. Is, is that true, uh, Slavin? Do, do, are neurosurgeons noted for that today, for being yeah. relatively slow in the operating room? Well, you know, I have experiences uh, from various centers here in Zagreb and uh, from uh, other parts of Croatia. Good afternoon, everybody. That's loud enough. Uh, who is this? My okay. name is uh, Josh Fiddler. I have the honor and privilege of sharing the... Please. That's the video playing. And, uh, I think you have to shut that video off, uh, Slava. Oh, yeah. uh, welcome to the installation. Oh, okay, yeah. well, I think we're going to wrap it up, Slavin. Okay? Okay. Uh, uh, well, there's, uh, there's, there's Bernardo coming back. Maybe we'll ask him. Uh, Bernardo, did you hear the question I asked? No, uh, sorry. I okay, uh, uh, neuro, like, uh, dur during the presentation, uh, Slavin mentioned that Dr. Cushing was noted for his very meticulous, slow manner of operating. Is that typical of neurosurgeons? Are they noted for being very slow and meticulous, or that doesn't apply today? Uh, I think it depends. I, I know some neurosurgeons that, that the surgery don't, don't run, you know, don't walk. <laughs> Oh, okay. And another ones are more meticulous, and others are more f likes to be more fast. You know, right? Uh, I think that are there are two two types of surgeons. Uh, you know, okay. Uh, some things that I I could observe in the the presentation. Okay. Uh, that there are so, some things that are so similar to nowadays, like the technique of opening of closer the instruments and the, uh, there are other things that are so different like the anesthesia <laughs> and, yeah. and the, the wearing of, of, of surgeons during the surgery. <laughs> yeah, they're, very they're, good. They're, Thank you for showing us these presentations. Yeah, very, very you, great. You, you know, let me just a quick remark. They had no IV solutions then. Uh, that was amazing and they couldn't transfuse blood. Yeah, something curious was the silver foil. <laughs> uh, 
Yes, I, I didn't know. Yeah, it. there were a lot of very, but a great, great video. Well, I don't know where you got that, Slava, but excellent video. So yes. I'd like to thank you, Slava. We'll wrap it up now, and we can hang around and chat. Thank you very much, Slava. If you do a thank presentation you. like that during the conference, you will be a lion of the conference. <laughs> thank you very much. I don't think so. But thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Bernardo, for coming. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Mm-hmm.